let's start by creating a Spring Boot project. Here I have one such project created using start.spring.io. I'm using the Spring Boot version of 2.1.3 and I've added security as one of the dependencies. Once we download then open this project in the POM XML, we can ensure that these dependencies are added. Let's create a simple controller to test our security features. So here we have a hello controller and there is a method called hello whose job is to only take a parameter and return a greeting based on whatever the name is passed as the parameter. This method is triggered on this particular URL of slash hello. We'll run the main class which will start the Spring Boot application and we can see as the last line that the application has started. So if we trigger the URL localhost 8080 slash hello, Spring Boot will send a response of 302 and redirect you to the login page automatically. We can also confirm this behavior by using the Chrome Dev Tools. So here I triggered the URL of hello and I passed in a request parameter of name and as a response it returned the status code of 302 and redirected to the login page. That means by just adding Spring Security Starter as one of the dependencies of our Spring Boot project, all the URLs that we create for our web application are by default secure and they require us to log in. But now we have a problem where we do not have any users to log in with. In such case, you can go back to the console of your project and you'll see Spring has generated a security password on server startup. We can copy this password, go back to the login page, have the username as the string user and the password as whatever we just copied. And when we do the sign in after that, it will take us back to the correct URL, which is slash hello. And it will execute the method wherein we get the greeting of hello there. So Spring Boot by default creates a user for us and auto generates a password every time the server is started so that we can utilize the same for testing. If we want to avoid copying this auto generated password all the time, we can go to application properties and add these two properties. So this is another way of creating a user for our application. And now when we restart our server, we can use this custom username and password to log into our application. Also, Spring Boot Security has this feature wherein you can add a principle to your MVC methods. This object represents the authenticated user who is calling this particular URL. So in our case, we'll take that user instead of the request parameter name and it springs responsibility to inject this principle based on which user has logged in. You can also achieve the same behavior by using this thread local of security context holder. So just like the previous slide, you can get that authenticated user using this static class of thread local. So we'll restart our server, try the same URL again, and we will log in with the user as admin. And this time, since we have changed the greeting to use the authenticated user's username, it will return us hello there admin instead of the request parameter that we just sent. So this is one way to personalize your responses based on which user is accessing the URL. Of course, while developing the system, you, you would want not just one user, but multiple users. So one way of creating multiple users is to use in-memory authentication. So here we have a class which implements WebMVC Configurer. It's a configuration. And within it, we have another static class which extends Web Security Configure Adapter. This inner static class, you can also have it as a standalone class. But most of the examples on GitHub about Spring Boot security are all having this application security as an inner static class. You can override this method of configure, which gives us an auth. And within the auth, we can just mention that I want to use an in-memory authentication and I want to declare these two users. Here we are having this user one with a password user one and user two with this password user two. We'll discuss about authorities later. So once we have written this code, we'll restart the server. And now instead of admin, which was specified in application properties, we can use these multiple users. We can use any of them and log in using the corresponding credentials. But however successful login, 
instead we'll get an error in the console and that's because it's highly recommended never to store your passwords in plain text because it's unsecure but since we are doing this for demo and learning purposes and we have all the authentication as an in memory authentication we can prefix our passwords with this special string called no op this tells spring security that this password is a plain text password and not a special hash version of the original password and now when we restart the server and try to log in with user 1 we'll have a successful login and one more way to define users is to use the jdbc authenticator wherein all the user details are stored in a database and you're just configuring the data source to tell spring security to store and retrieve the users from that particular data source so in this case we have the previous static inner class as a standalone class and we have auto wired a dependency of data source we'll again override this method of configure but instead of saying in memory authentication this time we'll say jdbc authentication and we'll set this particular injected data source and again since we are using this only for demo purposes we'll have a password encoder of type no op password encoder which says that all the passwords are stored as plain text and before we restart the server we need to ensure that we have these two tables in our database and you can create these tables yourself manually or you can add an sql in your resources folder called schema.sql and add these two table schemas in that sql file spring boot will ensure that whenever it starts up it will run these two scripts and it will create those tables for you now the login page that we saw earlier was a spring boot default login page it is also possible to have a custom login page so we'll go to the templates directory in our resources folder and we'll create a file called login html but the spring boot still doesn't know that we want to use this login html so we'll go back to our web security config we'll override this method called add view controllers where we'll say that if someone has this url which is slash login use this particular view name which is login and it extends to login html or login jsp and in our case it's login.html and in the application security class we need to override this method of configure and we have to say and our login page is of this particular url this is the url spring boot will redirect that user to and if the user puts in bad credentials or wrong user id and password then it redirects the user to this particular failure url and we saw that by default every url has to be authenticated otherwise it is redirected to the login page but the login page itself of course has to be open to everyone and that is why after the login and the failure url will say permit all which is to say allow anyone to access these two urls and we say anything else which is any other request ensure that they are fully authenticated again when we restart the server we'll see our own bootstrap related login page and this will work exactly the same as before now spring boot security also allows us to use oauth to authenticate our users so to enable oauth you have to add this dependency of oauth to client you can use any of the oauth providers i have chosen google so we can go to this url which is to create a new oauth client so you have to register yourself as a developer and google will give back two things to you one is the client id and one is the client secret we'll come back to our application and add these properties as part of the spring security oauth2 client properties so here we are saying that it's a oauth2 client of type google and the client id is this and the client secret is this no other changes are required to your application when you restart your server by default just like before it was going on to spring's own login page this time it will go to a page where you'll have a link of google and if you click on google it will ask you which account you want to log in with or the email id and password it will do the authentication on its own and redirect the failure or the success back to our application so in the last few years most of the ui and the server side development has been separated out wherein you have a separate single page application for the ui so the login pages that we saw earlier in these cases cannot be used anymore
in that case you need a rest based api based authentication so we'll use the same code as we did before with let's say the in memory authentication or the jdbc authentication we'll try to trigger this hello url with any of the api clients so in my case i'm using postman and when we hit the url instead of getting 302 we are getting 401 which is unauthorized so for a single page application based on say react or angular js it makes sense that there is a 401 as a response ui can decide how to show the login page now i was slightly confused by this how does it understand when you are firing a url from a browser and it gives you a 302 and redirects you to the login page but if you use a postman to trigger the url it gives you 401 unauthorized instead so what i found was it is using the accept header which is passed by default by the browser so here in the rest client i'm adding the accept type as star slash star that is this accepts any content type and it gets 401 if i change the accept type to text html followed by these lists of content types that are acceptable then we'll get the login page because there is a 302 redirect and now since we do not have any login page here we have to use the basic auth mechanism to pass our credentials so basic auth in postman is directly a feature where you can just set the username and password and it will automatically convert it into an authorization header so that user id and password is converted as basic and base64 encoded values of our user id and password once this header is passed then instead of getting 401 we'll get 200 okay because there was a successful login and we get the correct response on successful authentication in the reply you also get a cookie which has the j session id use this session id for any of the subsequent requests you do not have to keep sending the basic auth header and spring boot will know that it is from an already authenticated user so all the subsequent requests will pass sometimes it's necessary to segregate the authentication based on urls so let's say you have a custom login page which we saw before you are using your own custom css and js so when the login html opens it will try to get the index.js and since all the urls except login have to be authenticated spring wrongly assumes that even index.js has to be authenticated and it returns a 302 instead of sending back the actual js and we can easily do that using the same snippet of code we used before where we ensured that our login is permitted to be accessible by all here we can add one more method called ant matchers and we can say any of these urls permit every user even the non-authenticated users to access these urls and now if we restart the server and try to get that js file it will correctly give us back the actual file and the last bit of this video is about authorization so you might have some admin functionality which is accessible only for admin users so in such cases you can again go back to the same code as before and have another ant matcher which says that if the url starts with this prefix of admin that ensure that the user has this role of admin now where do we define a user to a particular role that we already did in one of the first few slides when we created the in memory or the jdbc authentication so for every user we have the authorities method where we pass the list of roles for that particular user and in spring for every authority you have to prefix it with a role underscore and you can also have a complex mechanism so you can mix and match the roles based on your use case there are many more methods like this for fine grain control over who has access cores and csrf are two another important topics which i want to cover but we can do that in a separate video thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next one bye